Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike, tech, maintenance related questions. And as ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Right, Good. first question says, hi, Ollie and Alex. Can you Kato Peters. Oh yeah. Can you provide some guidance on how many times I can repair my Conti tube race inner tube after a puncture I'm using? Park Tools GP-2 pre-glued super patches. Um, the question does go on, but let's answer the most important one. How many times can you repair an inner tube? Or indefinitely. Indefinitely until you've got to the point of patches having to overlap or a larger split in the inner tube. Simple. Yeah. It's actually way better for the environment repairing them as well than just buying new. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Uh, next question, it's from Operation Dark Side. You read it out. I plan on doing my grocery shopping via bicycle, but I live over 10 kilometers from the next supermarket and the road is single lane tarmac mountain road. Are there any cargo road bikes that would let me somewhat keep up with the 50 to 70 kilometer an hour traffic? Or should oh, I go boy. with an e-cargo <clears throat> bike and travel on roads or gravel? Where does Richard uh, where does uh, no Operation, Operation Dark, Dark Side live? I don't know, but there's a couple of simple ones here. I don't know of any cargo bikes that are going to enable you to ride at 50 to 70 kilometers an hour. Even an e-cargo bike, unless you live in a place in the world where there's no e-bike regulations on the speed, is going to be limited to how fast it can go, mm. and therefore isn't going to enable you to keep up. I do think an e-cargo bike is a really good solution to going and doing your grocery shopping, but I think... I think the fix here is to choose a better route or time to go so that it's not really busy. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's a tech issue. Would you agree? Yeah. Okay, next question um, is from Quest Giver Cyradis, who said, what are the best laundry detergents to prevent accumulating stank in athletic wear? Um, I refuse to believe <laughs> that none of you sweat at all. Uh, right. We are we are actually got a video uh, how to wash cycling kit that Colin's done. It's in the coming weeks, um, actually, on GCN. But generally speaking, like, I mean, you don't want to use any like harsh bleaches or harsh detergents on there. And most things say delicates thirty. Yeah, I got um, one point I wanted to raise, and this is what Connor um, was telling me. But I assume he's going to mention it in his video. Is you need to use non biological washing. Um, liquid because if you use bio um it sort of st sticks and bonds to the material and therefore that's where the smells stick to and stay in the material really i think so um if you agree with that or you have information to progress this question further let us know in the comment section down below every day is a school day yeah uh next question is from patrick lanen who said, why don't cycle computer manufacturers, such as Wahoo or Garmin, incorporate a bell or alarm as a programmable function into one of the buttons? I see a lot of cyclists not having a classic bell on their expensive road bike. I'm one of them. So this would be a nice option for us roadies. Wahoo being your main sponsor, can you, uh, can't you ask for an update? Well, I mean, we could ask for an update. There's gonna be a couple of stumbling blocks, I feel. One, I'm not sure the physical hardware aspect has the capability to produce a loud enough sound that's already built into head units. Yep. Whilst they all do like an audible beep, that is by no means loud enough to replace a bell. So that will be a stumbling block for adding updates into products. But I think, I think as, a, as a collective, road cyclists should be better at having bells on their bike. And I, for one, am someone that don't, doesn't have a bell on my bike. And I, do have situations. I think I wish I had one. I think it depends where you ride. Yeah, I, I like on the road don't need one. I, I okay. would say generally. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's just not something that's I find a use for. However, if you're riding in urban areas, yeah, most of my riding like isn't in an urban area on bike paths, but shared spaces, urban areas, you know, bike paths where there's a lot of pedestrians particularly, a bell is, yeah, like a really, really good thing to have on your bike. But I, I think you're kind of like solving a problem here that doesn't need to be solved. Just get an actual bell. And there are loads of options available. Yeah. Like, you know, we've shown them on the, on the shows before. Um, hide my bell, do loads of ones that are designed for bikes with 
you know, aero handlebars and they're designed yeah. into out front mounts so they're out the way. Um, and there's just really nice bells out there as well, like Spur Cycle make really nice machined CNC yeah, bells I think that's, really good quality. I think that's a stumbling block for people with a road, uh, like really fancy road bike is you don't want to feel like you're attaching a like trashy cheap bell. So mm. get a nice quality one and then maybe people will use them more. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what have we got next? Mr. E331. Three, 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 one. One. After you. Uh, he said, what's up crew? I have a training question regarding a Ooh. bike race I'll be riding this coming fall. I think he means auto. Oh, God. Um, uh. It's 68 <clears throat> miles with 6,000 feet of elevation um, and it has some gradients around 15 to 20%. I intend to race with a 34 tooth cassette on the rear. Yeah. Is there any benefit to training on a smaller cassette, like a 30 tooth? Or would you train on the same cassette you intend to race on? Easy. Train with the equipment that you're intending to use in your event. I don't think the theory of using harder gears translates to like better fitness improvements. Really? I don't think it does. I think it would just train you to grind up the climb rather than ride efficiently how you're likely to do it in the race. Yeah, you got you get good specificity there using that kind of... Uh, well, that um, kind yeah, of that, that would... That would be my take on it. I don't know why you would maybe train a lower cadence, really grind up the climb, and get to your event, and then expect your body to be magically adapted to spinning more. Yeah, yeah. Specificity <clears throat> is—you can't go wrong with specificity in your training. You know? Yeah, your training should reflect whatever you're training for. Yeah, that's the simplest thing. If you want to improve a song, practice it. There you go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Jay uh, Lib next. Hi, Alex, Ollie, and Manon. I have a question concerning the optimal tyre pressure. What do I do if the calculated optimal tyre pressure, for example, using Silker's calculator, is lower than the minimum pressure written on the side of my tyre? Can this be dangerous? And then we've got an example here on their tyres specific to them. Um, my gut says never ever exceed maximum pressures or go below minimum pressures for what is written on a certain piece of equipment, be that your tyres or your wheels. Use the online calculators as guides to give you an indicator where you can go with your tyre pressure. Yeah, I think that's, that's what safe, I yeah. Um, yeah, so in the interest of safety, always stick to those upper and lower limits and then use the calculators to tweak it. Um, yeah. I think that's a, a good yeah. way to look at it. We have a, a question as well, which was which was emailed in oh, from yes. um, a chap called Richard, who wants to know why don't we see uh, riders regularly using mirrors on their road bikes? Well, that, I think that's a good question. And uh, whilst I don't know an official answer to this, I think it's just the, the way that the bike industry has gone. It's not a product that has taken off. People maybe deem that they don't feel like they personally need that. Yeah, oh, I mean, I would say that most riders don't need it. No. In that, you know, it's... If you're riding down, you know, if you're... Basically, most riders are capable of just looking over their shoulder and turning and, and doing that. And that's what most people do when they, you know, they don't pull out without looking over their shoulder when you, you should... Yeah. learn to do that or be trained to do that um, and particularly in the case of like racing that's what you'll see racers do you see them do it on the track and you're trained to do that when you ride on the track that's yeah. the first thing you do when you move up the banking you look to see what's there um, and that you know it, it's a, a, a mirror is adding weight bulk and drag to potentially to, to a bike and doesn't really need it however they are still useful and what I am aware of is that particularly with riders that have neck mobility issues that's um, a good point you know yeah. for whatever reason that might be some people do have difficulty in turning their neck over their shoulder um a mirror becomes incredibly useful and you can get some nice little ones yeah that are either built into sunglasses or just a very subtle thing that just attaches onto the, the side of the helmet that, that give you that without you know having to turn your head you can just look and see so there are options out there I guess it just boils down to personal preference also even if you <clears throat> even if just having it gives you that peace of mind that you've got a bit of an idea of what's going on behind you you can yeah. also get good ones that yeah. go into bar end instead of a bar yeah. end plug you yeah. can have one that plugs into your drop bar um, bar end good, and, yeah. and they're, they're pretty minimalist and quite a lot of riders use those but if you want to use a, a mirror yourself Richard Absolutely. Go, Go ahead. If you're good, it's going to be useful to you, use it. Yeah. 
Right, on to our last question. It's from Imi06. They say, help GCN waxing gurus. I've just tried waxing my chain for the first time. I used Silka's chain stripper and hot melt wax method as per the instructions and your video. My drivetrain is now extremely noisy. I then tried re-waxing the chain and the noise is still present. Does the noise go away? Should I top up with drip on wax? Um, they'd be grateful for our advice on the situation. Yeah, so I've had this issue. I actually had, um, like, I had it this weekend, actually, on a, on a chain that I'd freshly waxed. Now, I found that if I ride... Firstly, there is a bit of a skill in terms of how when you take the chain out yeah. at the at the right temperature with that skin forming on the hot melt wax, um, so that you do get enough wax on the chain, and that takes a couple of times doing it. I think to really get at that least, right. I feel like I'm still perfected it. Yeah, and then because the viscosity of the wax is changing at different temperatures, so you need to get the wax to sort of stick onto the chain. What I've also found, and this happened the very first time I, I waxed the chain as well, and it and it happened this weekend, was that normally I find myself running in the chains indoors on the mm -hmm. turbo, and it's much warmer in my house yeah, okay. than it is outdoors. And it was really cold when I put this new chain on and rode it outside. And because the ambient temperature of being outside, we're still in winter here, yeah. is bloody cold, that affects the... The, like the um, breaking period. still affects the viscosity of the, the wax. Okay. You know, wax gets softer as you heat it up like a candle. And so it I find it breaks in much quicker. Like you're talking about I find about 15 minutes riding on the turbo indoors yeah. and the chain breaks in and you you just it goes a lot quieter and it and it's just then quiet and good. But I was riding outdoors for like an hour. It's quite a long time still, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And it took about an hour of riding to break it in. And that, yeah, I'm putting that down to temperature. But it did break in and it did go quiet. I've tried using um, a method which you uh, mentioned to me a while back, which is to like manually free off the links before you put it onto the bike by like articulating the chain around like a plastic stick or a bin handle or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I find that was particularly helpful. Um, but basically, it just takes a bit of time for it to quieten down a bit. Yeah, so yeah. after you've um, waxed your chain, I would say do that. Loosen it off before you put it in. So both ways and just like run it like a like like a hand chainsaw Yeah. over like a, a piece of dowel or something. Yeah. Just to loosen it down. Just to add one final thing into the mix before we wrap this up is that I've also heard from reputable sources, such as Adam from Zero Fiction Cycling, that the break-in period for 12-speed chains when they've been waxed is longer than the break-in period for 11-speed chains. Yeah. So that's something to consider as well. And your final thing that you ask about topping up with drip-on wax to kind of like help break it in and loosen it off, um, yeah, I mean, it's the same same active ingredients that are in the drip-on, so yeah, you, by all means, if you give that a try, give that a try yeah. yeah. I've actually done that before and it works. All right, perfect. So that's it for this week's GCN Tech Clinic. Hope we've got um, to your question. If we haven't, as always, let us know in the comments section down below. And, um, well, we'll pick it up in the coming weeks. See you later. Bye. Bye.